My name is uh, Matthew Patrick, Victor Echo 6, Alpha Zulu X ray. And uh, this is Nick Jansen, uh, Victor Alpha 6, Tango Sierra, right? And Oscar Bravo Sierra. And Oscar Bravo Sierra. Um, we are two amateur radio operators who uh, sort of found very different paths to doing high altitude ballooning, but uh, ran into each other. And Nick was actually the one who taught me uh, and everyone at the University of Calgary who are just getting into high altitude ballooning for some of our experiments, how to do it. And he's brought today some of uh, the some of the payloads that have actually flown, you know, in the stratosphere and near space for us to pass around and, and take a look at, which will be really cool. I'm here to explain what high altitude balloons are. Uh, everyone's heard them in the news. You know, it turned into a surprisingly big topic the last last month. Uh, and why you would launch such a thing and what they're good for. And then finally, I want to say a couple things about how you can participate as amateur radio operators, because this is a topic which is special to me for a couple of reasons. The main reason is, as people who are good with radios and who are really technically inclined, people who want to get into the technology, people who want to participate, you're not just like a passenger on a sailing ship when it comes to this kind of thing. It's not like you go to Cape Canaveral and watch a rocket launch, which is great, right? If you've done it, if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. This is where you get to be crew. This is where you get to actually participate in the thing and go and get your hands dirty and, and launch something that goes not quite to space, but close enough. So I want to tell you what high-altitude ballooning is, a couple of the common applications, the flight characteristics of these platforms, what you can expect if you go and buy one of these things and set them up. Um, then a little how-to, just top level, 10-minute, how do you actually go and get one of these things in the air and hopefully get it back? Um, it's actually not that complicated of a process, but it's something which takes a heck of a lot of experience to get exactly right. And then uh, there's finally, last topic is some uses for amateur radio. Why as amateur radio operators would we be interested in this technology? Uh, it's got a long heritage of being used by hams for amateur radio purposes. And it's something which is carried on by a lot of the pioneers who actually started doing this in amateur radio are still flying balloons today, which is really cool. Uh, so a high altitude balloon is just a large membrane structure, uh, stretchy, uh, made out of a thin film material. It can be latex, it can be polyethylene, plastic, and it's filled with a lift gas. And in practice, there are only two lift gases which you can use, only one of which anybody can afford. There's <laughs> hydrogen and there's helium. When I started high altitude ballooning with Nick back in 2015, we would often use helium because it's quite safe, right? It's inert. And then the price for helium cylinders started to ratchet up until eventually it would be like a down payment on a car in order to do a balloon launch, which is not going to happen. So with some generous safety precautions, everybody uses hydrogen now. Uh, payload you suspend on a cable beneath the balloon. And then you let it go. It goes to an altitude of around 30 to 36 kilometers high, which is well outside the troposphere and into the stratosphere, much higher than even commercial aviation flies. And uh, the flights last, depending on how you design it, a few hours to a few days, although there are exceptions. Some of the real pioneers in this field have been ham radio operators like us. And they have done balloon flights, which have circumnavigated the world over nine times. I'll show you an example of some of those later. So there are some really, there's no one profile that fits all the balloon flights. You can design these things to behave in different ways. Um, like I said, there's a long tradition of amateur radio balloon flying. So this is sort of a schematic diagram from the Canadian Space Agency of what, what the layers of the atmosphere look like as a function of height. You have the troposphere down here, which is where we all live, where the weather happens where most airplanes fly. And then you've got the stratosphere. The stratosphere is gonna start at around, depending on the day, you know, eight, nine, 10 kilometers or so, depending. This is where you find stratospheric balloons and very, very few exceptional supersonic aircraft. You remember in the news when that spy balloon, the alleged spy balloon was over uh, the United States, they had to use, I believe it was a U-2 spy plane in order to take pictures of the thing. 
This is a very difficult to reach area of the atmosphere. And one of the reasons that this is so cool that we have access to it is because it's got a lot of the benefits of launching something like a satellite, but you don't have to fork out, you know, quarter of a million dollars for to SpaceX in order to do it. So what does your typical high altitude balloon look like? These are nothing exotic. And what I want to what I want to explain partly here is that with all this sort of sensation in the news and everything, people sort of think that uh, like the public thinks these are some special high tech thing that maybe is a you know new technology. It's absolutely not. Balloons have been used since antiquity. And they're used every single day by stations all across Canada and the world to predict the weather. What they do is they have a, a station like this. It's basically just a shed. And they take this big latex weather balloon. It's, you know, about four or five feet across when it's filled on the ground. They fill it up and then they launch it with the radio sound on, which just transmits back temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, because it's got a GPS on it. And they use that to make the weather forecast we use every single day. So if you're um, someone who owns land out by Stony Plain, for example, where our closest launch station is, you may well have seen one of these things just landed in your field. They don't get them back. So these are not uncommon. And if you see one in the sky, it's not really a cause for alarm because this is something that happens literally every day. Sometimes more. If there's an interesting weather event happening, they may launch several to get really good measurements and make a really good forecast. So that's kind of the first and most common type of balloon. And as amateur radio operators, it's more or less the one that we would be flying, something in this class. Uh, for weather prediction, they launch closest station that I know of is here, just outside of Edmonton. There are days where the winds blow south and you can sort of track these things as they come towards Calgary. And if you're interested, all of the frequencies that these use, these are published. And there's open source software. You can take a UHF Yagi and you can you can track these things and receive their data in real time. You don't even have to launch one yourself. If you want to go and hunt these things, there's a large contingent of people, mostly in Europe, but in other places too, would make uh, an entire hobby out of waiting for high altitude balloons to be launched for weather purposes. And then they go and they, they use their radio skills to track them down. It's like uh, box hunting, except the target is flying, so it's a little harder, I guess. And more fun. Yeah, more fun, exactly. So um, there are other kinds of balloons, though, and I don't need to explain this picture. Everyone's familiar with it. No one's, oh, have you not seen this one before? This is, <laughs> this is the big one. This is what's probably going to be responsible for uh, balloons attracting a lot of attention over the next little while. Sometimes people use bigger balloons for different purposes. Uh, and I am not in the intelligent business. I don't, I'm, I'm just a scientist. I don't know why someone would launch something like that and let it drift over the United States. All that I can do is tell you some of its properties. It's uh, one of the larger balloons that you can get. It's a super pressure balloon is the name given to it. And it, it has an interesting little trick that it does. Instead of going up and bursting, like the sounding balloons do, like the weather balloons do. This one just goes up in parks and it stays there for a long time until eventually the sun degrades the plastic and it comes down. You would see that this had solar panels pretty clearly on either side here. So it was obviously intended to fly for some time. Otherwise you would just use batteries. And if I recall correctly, it was cruising at around 46,000 feet ish. Don't quote me on that. Anyway, uh, this caused quite a stir because something like this is not difficult to uh, see from the ground and eventually it was shot down and destroyed. I hope someday we find out what it was carrying and why it was doing what it did, but until now I have, I have no honest idea. Your guess is as good as mine. So there are apparently other applications for this technology. Um, but one of these big balloons like this with the solar panels want to emphasize these things are used for scientific purposes too all the time they're not as commonly flown as the little latex sounding balloons for weather but if you want to do a large-scale study like uh, measuring radiation from space you would use something like this and they're quite a bit more expensive but they last a lot longer so where I come into ballooning was pretty much during my PhD I was working on space weather and what space weather is is it's the analogy of weather on the ground, but for the whole, around the earth and in the wider solar system. 
the sun, and, and as radio operators, you all know this very well, right? The sun plays a pivotal role in how radio communications work on Earth. This is something every ham knows, and, and a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the practical knowledge about how that interplay between radio and space works is due to amateurs, which is really cool. If you want to measure when the radiation from space comes down and impacts the Earth's atmosphere, it's a little tricky. There are a couple of things you can do. One of them is you can try to measure it from the ground, but fortunately, the Earth is a really good radiation shield. Not much of it reaches the ground. If you put your sensors on a balloon, though, you can get above most of the atmosphere by mass, and you can make your measurements in a way that gets them to you in near real time with a much higher signal of noise than you could on the ground. That's why I asked Nick to teach everyone, us at the University of Calgary, how to safely fly and retrieve high altitude balloons, because Nick had been doing it as a way before we started. And that's kind of how, how I got into this. So in the end, we flew a bunch of balloons, often from Nick's cabin out at Carbon, Alberta, and we got most of them back, and I got my measurements and then graduated, which was great. But I still do it because it's a lot of fun. Oh, so some of that PhD is mine? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Too bad. But um, there's a whole other there's a whole other branch of ballooning, and it's the one that I want to focus on mainly tonight. Scientists use balloons to make measurements about space or about the atmosphere and weather, but amateurs sometimes do this just for fun. And one of the neat little spin-off hobbies that has happened over the last, I'd say, 10 years, roughly, um, is the invention of uh, little balloons, pico balloons. So this little guy is just a mylar balloon like you'd find in a party store. It's 36 inches across. You fill it partially with lift gas, and you have on the bottom an amateur radio transmitter, and then you let it go. Now, what's really neat about this is for a fraction of the cost, that Chinese spy balloon, it'll hang out roughly where that thing was hanging out, and it'll just go around and around the world a bunch of times. Nick has an example right here. So if you can build your transmitter small enough and light enough, you can put it on one of these little balloons, and they won't burst. They go and they expand and they just stay. And you can park it in the atmosphere and let it go around in the jet stream. So several people have, in the amateur radio community, pioneered this technique and made it work. And now uh, the little trackers, if you don't want to build one yourself like Nick has done, they're even commercial products. You can just buy them and uh, set them off. I have a few. They cost 50 bucks, I think. So it's really, really neat. Uh, what this sort of technology has enabled us to do. And this is an example of one of these tiny trackers. It's from uh, qrplabs.com. Uh, I believe this is a slightly older model, but all it is is this little board, and it transmits over HF. So you dangle a long piece of magnet wire down, and you send out uh, over a couple of modulations. There are a few that they use. Whisper is one of them, for anyone who's familiar with that. One of the spin-off uses of Whisper is for high-altitude balloon telemetry. The creators and maintainers of the Whisper network have been very generous in sharing us balloon operators' use of their worldwide set of reporting, uh, reporting stations. But there are others, too. The Joe Taylor modes are particularly well adapted for this. Uh, they work well with low-power transmitters. FSQ has been used as well as QRSS. I should also add the little one that I'm passing around, it uses high speed Morse code and field help. The little one, the, the next size up, that's this one, is using RTTY and field help. So you got a lot of flexibility if you want to do a balloon flight and how you want to transmit. And the truth is, you put your antenna sufficiently high, as we all know, your link budget supports it, you can receive it almost anywhere. So these ones are really cool. They're solar powered, like the Chinese balloon, just orders and orders of magnitude smaller. So they can park up there and go around for a long time. Usually it's either UV degradation that brings them down, slow leaks, or uh, the other thing that can happen is if they fly through a particularly high rain cloud, water sticks to them, makes them heavier, and they, they land in the middle of nowhere. Um, so eco balloons are gonna be an interesting topic over the next months to year, particularly because it's suspected that they shot one down over uh, Yukon. And you can imagine that oil balloon makes a nice radar cross section. And uh, with all the hysteria around the other balloon, I guess a few phone calls must have been made and eventually an F-22 was sent up. Um, with a $400,000 missile? With a, 
$400,000 missile, you know, two of them, you use two? Okay, so we two $400,000. That's, um, that's our subsidy to uh, Lockheed Martin in terms, right? Anyway, so this, um, this was apparently, and we don't have hard proof of this, but it's very plausible, used to uh, shoot down something that looks like, uh, looked like this, right? I, I imagine the total integrated cost of the system was not more than $200. And uh, it was it was destroyed because what you could see is that amateur radio operators were tracking this in real time using Whisper, and they were plotting the positions of this thing with its onboard GPS. And then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, it stopped transmitting in the middle of the day at exactly the same time that one of these F-22 shot a, a UFO down right in that location. It was broadly concluded that you know we were uh, we were one of the unfortunate casualties of this this incident. So it'll be interesting to see in the years coming what happens with regards to regulations and etiquette for launching these flying things. Right now, we're in kind of a, a good time because there are very few. As long as they're not posing a danger to anyone, no one really cares. They're party balloons. They're party balloons, right? These things that you buy at the party store online. So um, I want to hand things over to Nick almost right away here to show you some of the examples of things that have actually flown in the stratosphere. Yeah, so but, I've already shown you two of the little, I call them my Pico basic designs. These are very homemade designs um, using my skills as a radio operator. Uh, we have a few other options here, and I want to show these ones and talk a little bit about flights with them. And then I was going to show you a website and how you predict where things are going to go before you fly. This is actually my second payload design that I ever created long before I met Matthew. Um, this one has been to space, or I call it space, it's not space. In the old days, it'd be space. Yes. Uh, and I think by the American definition, it is still considered space to them uh, because those pilots that go into that range are actually considered astronauts. Um, this is. Yeah, one of the first ones. It's flown about 10 times. This, you'll probably recognize a lot of the internals. I'll pass this around as well. Please be careful. This is a flight unit, and I do intend on flying it again at some point. Yes, you can. Uh, you'll notice there's a handheld radio in here. There's a backup spot tracker, and there's an off-the-shelf. Did you throw that out that camera, Nick? Oh, yes. Yeah, there you go. Say that again. Um, yeah, so we have the handheld radio right here. We've got this backup spot tracker, which has saved us many times. Uh, you'll notice I actually haven't really plugged it all in right now, but um, this this payload is quite heavy. And you'll actually notice the GoPro camera on the front as well. This is how we've achieved a lot of the video and photos that we have over the years. This payload also has, has but it's kind of buried in here, ability to cut down. Cut down is the ability to terminate a flight before it's it bursts. Uh, if the balloon is, this is actually a used cut down mechanism, you can see. I put a 10 ohm resistor here, and it actually melts through. This is the flight line that we use to the balloon. It'll actually melt that at altitude, and it cuts your payload from the balloon, and the payload will drop with the parachute attached here, and the balloon will float away and land somewhere else. It's a cheaper alternative to an F-22. It's <laughs> much cheaper alternative than an F-22. I think a resistor costs less than one penny. So there's an example. I will pass this around. Please take a look at it. Please be very careful of the lens on the front and don't dump anything out. And please watch the, the very sharp antennas. This is, I think it's a cut uh, um, quarter wave two meter antenna on that one. Um, one thing that we've, that happens over time is the longer you've been in this hobby, the smaller your payloads get. Um, this is a new design by another ham radio operator who's planning on launching again very soon. This is actually a box that has not flown yet. Uh, you'll notice it's a little bit cleaner. It doesn't even have the label. If, if it's lost, please find it. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting about the camera. Uh, this is a custom PCB that was actually made specific for this purpose. I will pull it out. It is in here very tight. So that uh, one hasn't flown yet? This one has, uh, this unit has flown, but this box has not. Okay. Um, in fact, one of these landed in water and it actually did not destroy it. Uh, this actually has a temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor on it as well. 
Uh, a different version of that has a temperature sensor on it in previous flights. This is also transmitting on 144, 990, and 390. And now you know the, the frequency I use because I don't like people knowing that uh, because I use RDF on that frequency. So I don't want other people transmitting it. Right. Uh, you've seen our, our micro ones. The, a little bit of the camera just so you can get the large payload that is passing around has been to 131,000 feet. It was aboard a 2,000 ground balloon, which was a little bit bigger than the ones that Matthew showed. Um, that was a very cool flight. And we found there was a programming error on that right. modem. It uh, cut out at 127,000 feet and stopped working. Our latest design, which is thanks to a ton of research from Matthew's side, um, is a much newer, smaller, lighter payload design. So the box is quite a bit smaller. You'll again see that we have the if found, this is not a bomb part. This, I'm just going to pull out the unit. This is an off the shelf. Um, device that you can program with any operating system you want. We've tried with many different kinds. Um, this uses 900 megahertz, not 1.44 megahertz. It has a external temperature sensor on it, and we have ability to hook in shutdown mechanisms and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a very cool design. I would pass this one around as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is show you how you know where your balloon's going to go before you launch it. We've actually found that this is very accurate. It's a lot more accurate than you think. If you don't land where you thought you were going to land, it was probably that you didn't put the right amount of gas in your launch. Uh, my very first launch was hydrogen. I focused very much on the properties of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the best lifting gas that you can possibly get. It's also the most abundant element in the entire universe. Um, helium is the second most abundant element in the universe, but does not chemically bind to anything. So it's quite rare on Earth. It's hard to get. Just grab your website here. Sure. OK, so uh, on this website, which I have um, curated for many years, is every single launch that the group that I've kind of created in Calgary has launched. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec, but I first want to talk about predictions. This is, so you can use this predictor to try, to calculate where your balloon's going to land from where you launch and how much you fill the balloon up. So let's say you launch your balloon from somewhere near, I don't know, here. It looks like a great place to live. Uh, how do you do that again? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, they've changed this a couple of times. This is a site that's produced by one of the universities in the UK. Um, we've set our launch location to the dot on the screen. Next, we're going to estimate our launch altitude in meters is probably about 900. Um, we're going to use the burst calculator to determine where our balloon's going to go. So we purchased, maybe we purchased the Kmon 3000 balloon because we were both excited about trying that someday. Uh, and let's say we're launching that little payload over there, which is about 150 grams with the battery in it. Uh, and we're gonna target a descent rate of four meters <clears throat> per second. So using these parameters, we know the balloon's gonna burst at 41.3 kilometers straight up. Uh, it's going to take 167 minutes to get there, and it tells us how much gas it's going to use. So we're going to plug that right into the predictor, uh, and we're going to go for one prediction. That balloon, if you launch it now, will end up there. In Saskatchewan, it looks like. Uh, it tells you how far it is. Well, that's 200 kilometers away, and we'll fly for three hours and 30 minutes, and that includes a five meter per second descent rate. So just for just for comparison, like this flight, I would never want to do. This is this is a this is going to be a bad time. Um, you launch this thing; it's going to take forever to get up there. It's going to take forever to land, and you're going to have to go into the middle of nowhere to get it. It's sounds like fun to me. It's 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 great. It's a great time. If that's your kind of thing, I like to wait for when the winds are calmer and it doesn't go as far. But you can predict a couple of days out. You see, we actually launched one day that the wind was so bad that it was 
dragging us across the field, but with the balloon in our hands. That was so that was not that was the time. It was many laughs were had after. <laughs> uh, so on this website, which I do encourage you to check out later when you have time. Um, is every single light and launch that this group has done, we have launched 86 balloons. And for every launch, we say what type of balloon it was, how big the balloon was, where we launched it from, when it was launched, approximately where it went, and any notes, usually altitude is on there. And for each flight, let's pick it. I'm going to pick my first one. Um, we usually have a write up, a short write up, a some photos, you can see, oh, that's slow. Some photos and some videos. To give you an idea of how big these balloons are, that's how big the balloon is. I know it's hard to see, but it's bigger than a person at launch. I'm just looking for a good one with some video. I can't remember which one I usually show. I don't know the video is going to work anyway. So, one of the reasons that you can make a phone call and uh, you know everyone starts getting alert to these things is they're they're not just one size. So on the ground you fill it up and it was like in that picture, right? Roughly person size. As they ascend, the pressure around them decreases, and so they start to expand. And that thing, when it bursts, could be thirty feet in diameter. So you can see it from the ground. It looks like Venus or something during a bright day. <laughs> so this is an example of an APRS track from one of my launches. Uh, you can see it launched from here, ignore this line. Uh, and it flew all the way down to here and landed there. And yes, that is Michael's name. Uh, this was done with a school. Uh, only a few students actually came for the launch. Uh, this is where it landed, how it landed. Is that that same box over there, or is this an earlier rendition of that? Uh, it looks like the same box. I think, yeah, this, this is the same one. That's cool. Um, which one had that video that you remember? <laughs> I think it was launch number two. So why, as ham radio operators, would this be exciting to you? In, in my mind, there's one answer to that, which is, you launch this thing and on VHF or UHF, you've got like a 700 kilometer footprint on it. And it's one of the ways that you can communicate over huge distances using the equivalent of almost a small satellite on frequencies that are accessible to everybody, even with a basic certificate. And that's something that's pretty commonly done. Uh, so I, I don't know how well videos will work on this anyway. If you do go on this website, there are many videos that you can watch there on YouTube. Uh, please do that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the most interesting landings we've had. Here's an example of one of our, one of our first worst landings. Um, yeah, we lost most of the hardware on this launch, but we were still able to find it. That's the only water in the whole field. <laughs> uh, that must have been a murky slot. My favorite landing was uh, we were approaching near Drumheller, and we were wondering why the part were swerving in the distance while tracking our balloon. Um, we got a little closer, it was strewn across the field. Um, and then we had two others that landed in between the, the road and the fence, so no private property on those ones. And my favorite all-time landing location, it landed on an island near Hannah. I recovered it with a kayak. We've had a few interesting ones at the UFC, too. One of our big stratospheric ones, not, not quite as big as the Chinese spy balloon, but getting up there, Landed in rural Saskatchewan yeah. after a research flight, and one of the uh, one of the gentlemen who owned a ranch near there picked it up, and I couldn't figure out why on my screen the tracker kept it kept moving after I knew for a fact that it had landed an hour ago. <laughs> we thought it was struck down the highway, and uh, it landed with faster, and he picked it up. Um, so we gave him uh, we gave him a couple hundred bucks for for finding it, sort of a feel good thing, right? Appreciate it. And then we 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 got it back. I want you to talk about this lunch. Those you know, lunch. You know, lunch. Lunch. Oh, no, not this one. <laughs> okay, so I'm still working on a couple of technologies that are not perfect yet. And if anyone has better ideas on how to do these kinds of things, I'm all ears because right now they're actually not working. 
a couple of years ago at the university, we had this we have this idea, and it's still an idea we're working on, where we want to take a balloon and we want to put a mechanism at the bottom that can vent out gas so that you can take one of these little guys that normally go up and burst and just park it up there for a long time. It'd be really useful. There are scientific experiments where I do this work. So we tried it. And it worked okay, except basically what happened was after I launched it, I figured out that the, uh, the little antenna, the little 900 megahertz antenna, was not making good contact with its connector. So we were transmitting effectively out of a dummy load, which is, and, and, and you know things get really bad when you start to bring out these antennas, right? You, you know your signal is pretty marginal. So we set this thing off and it went, it went pretty well, you know, until we lost contact with it because the radio wasn't working. Eventually though, holding it just like this, we're able to just barely get a packet through, just right above the noise floor. What we did on this one, I believe, yes, this is the, the one. This is the one. So it landed, deflated, and you can see our, our test mechanism under there. It's a, it's a part that I bought from a plumbing store. It actually worked okay. I just had like a robot arm that opened this plumbing valve. <laughs> so it landed, and then we figured out, hey, it's in the middle of this field, and Nick was there, and I was like, oh, shucks. I mean, I've got a quarter of a tank of gas still in the truck. We're just going to fill this thing up and do it. it was, we don't say that it, was, it wasn't a car. It was a very, it was a small truck. It's a small enclosed truck. Anyway, you um, filled it up again, and the same balloon just took off and it did another flight, and then we picked it up. And it later. landed again in usable form. So on the next landing, same day, but we damaged it, hauling it back to the car. One of our ideas, and we don't know if this is going to work like more than once, this is the only time this has ever happened. Is can you reuse these things? Can you do like SpaceX does, where you, you launch the thing and then you land it and then you just keep doing the same thing again? Normally, right, you have to replace the whole balloon. It goes and pops and then it comes back down. It costs you anywhere from 100 to 200 US dollars every time. They're not cheap. So it would be really cool if we could figure that out at some point. This was the second launch of that balloon, right from where the car was parked and it had landed not far from here. Uh, so we, we inflated it again. A little bit more, uh, and it landed intact one more time. I fixed the antenna before we could go. Unfortunately, while I was hauling it back, it hit a barbed wire fence, and missed. that was that was the end of that. So if you can if you can avoid that happening, we could have gone again. Would have been sort of cool. It was a long day by that point. Was the duration of the durations of those flights? A couple hours. Each one, a couple hours yeah. with a half an hour descent. So at this point, I think we'll, we'll ask if there's any questions, because I think we've covered a lot of information and um, feel free to look at the website and uh, ask us any questions you like. And that includes the people on the phone. I have one other comment to make before that, though, which is um, we don't launch these things infrequently. Right. Like almost every week I try to launch one of these. Last month has been a bunch of strikes for me because things have been failing in the thermal back chamber at the university. And so I kept canceling our launches at the last minute. But we will get back out there and fly these. And if you guys would like to join us, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Exactly. So the launch site has a APRS beacon. It's VE6TS-4. Uh, please ask either Matthew or myself before you go out there. There is a railroad track running around that. Don't drive on the track. It's what you want to ask you to with those. With that. Oh, Saskatoon. What was the name of that organization? There's a bunch of amateurs there that do that. I'm we did a group order with them once. So I, I, have a, I think that's right. Yeah. I think yeah. they changed their name, but it was start for me. Uh, met up with them last week. Yeah. 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 I remember teaching that one down. You know what so, would be really me, sorry. Well, if anybody speaks, can you speak a little louder so that people on the phone on the line can hear as well? One thing I've always wanted to try doing that I haven't been able to do is if we could get them to launch a balloon and us to launch a balloon, link them together, and make a bridge with no, repeaters. You could absolutely do it. One is a bit of a stretch from Calgary to Saskatoon, but two, absolutely. So if you're talking about making a balloon that's really buoyant, <clears throat> you can compress gas into like a pop bottle and be able to reduce buoyancy quite substantially. So what's the volume that you need to like what would be an average volume or altitude change that would be necessary? So I have the pumps to do that. It's it's a good idea, and we looked at using pumps for this kind of thing. The only problem is that our mass budget is not the greatest. So one of the regulations we have to follow is that the entire volume of your total fill on the ground 
unless you want to have a bunch of uh, there's a process unless you're under 115 cubic feet and then you can basically do whatever you want so we can only do things that weigh less than a kilogram or so and that includes the science instrument which is why we thought it'd be easier just to open the bottom and like let some out but you know if you could fit something like that on there sure it's possible that well, it could work you could breathe the press i can yeah. Can you do an application for an SOFC if it went bigger? Yeah, absolutely. It's just that they're going to ask you to have a, um, and we we did this for some of the university flights. You need a transponder. You need insurance. It's uh, it's a lot. It's a process, but it's absolutely doable. Do you know roughly what an insurance would cost? I'm just kind of wondering. Ballpark, yeah. ten grand for a flight, something like that. There, it, the risk profile of these things is not insignificant. Well, yeah, because you're going up through commercial airspace. That's the risk. So, I mean, that it's a good thing to bring up. When you're doing stuff like this, be sensible, right? I mean, the, the only real risk to people and property is that you're flying through the airlines on the way up, and then you're way higher than they'll ever go, so it doesn't matter. Then when you descend on the way down, you're crossing a game. So um, it's important to... Uh, so I'm a pilot, if you guys don't know that. Um, so I've studied air law quite a bit regarding this. There's not a lot of rules in place, but there's some recommendations. We should always notify Edmonton Flight Services before a launch, and we should launch from outside of Calgary's Class C airspace. The closest you can do that is between Bicycle and Carbon, um, somewhere in halfway between. And most flights go east, so don't try launching from the west side of the city. Uh, the video that I have up on the screen, and I don't know if it's going to work, is the balloon when it bursts, and it happens very quick. This is in real time. Is this your cut down over here? Uh, and that is the cut down wire. Uh, this is an uh, Ethernet twisted pair that runs to the cut down resistor. Uh, this time we can use it. This is what happens if you don't cut down and don't get shot down. <laughs> there, it's over. It happens fast. Do you ever have to hurt enough like electronics? Like, are you high enough that they start to degrade because you're getting hit? Uh, temperature. Temperature is a big thing, but the other thing that happens is the pressure is low and it goes down right to the ideal density that uh, high voltage electronics like to arc. Yeah. So the answer is basically put everything in styrofoam beer coolers. And uh, if you've got high voltage, just dump epoxy onto it and still it stops shorting out. That's how you fix that. <laughs> So you increase your payload weight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's one of the trade-offs, right? Like if you want to fly outside of the regulations, you want to be under that volume, only so much mass you can carry. And one of the reasons why these things kept getting smaller is because we wanted to send up bigger cameras, bigger experiments, that kind of thing. So there was less mass budget available for all of the support electronics. So that's a very small boxy would work for the arcing at all. Like the air gaps of the issues because that way you can at least get a little more. Yeah, we, we do that. So the videos don't look very good on here. So I would suggest if you want to watch them, just go on the website yourself. That's at A R K W R site. A R A W R dot C A. Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun to have more folks uh, on one of these flights. You know, the more people with receivers that you can have, you can fan out a little bit. The, higher the chances of getting these things back. We're, we're pretty good. Now, I don't think, Nick, you've ever actually strictly lost one. I don't think- None of think my payloads have was... ever been lost. You have a perfect- um, That yeah. doesn't mean that people's payloads that flew with me weren't lost. Me, I've, I've lost, I think, 70% of the things that I flew <laughs> deliberately or not, but we're always running new experiments. So there's a method where, you, where this works and there's a formula you follow where they almost always work. It's like the tried and true safe way. And then at the university, we were trying all these new things and routinely they would just, you know, not work. <laughs> we do have a checklist on our website, which I highly recommend if anyone does want to do this. Um, if you've ever worked for me, you'll know that the number one thing that I talk about is always have a checklist for anything important. This goes through some of the obvious stuff and the non-obvious stuff as well. When you're... Uh, when you're a pilot, the checklist is required, uh, and that's where I learned about this, and that's how I use it at work and in my hobbies.
That's uh, that's pretty much all I have for this. So if you guys would like to join us on one of these flights, you're more than welcome. It would be a ton of fun. So there are a couple of ham radio things I thought that we could do on some of the test flights. You know, it'd be sweet if we could put a crossband repeater of our own up there. Um, get some good get some good DX on some really really high frequencies that usually you can't do that on. APRS is always welcome. I mean, if you've got some things that you don't mind risking losing. We can fly them. It's it's not too much effort. A 360 <laughs> camera comes to mind. Yeah, be careful with the 360. Okay, I, I spent seven hundred dollars on that, and some farmer is going to find what's left of it in their field with some really interesting footage. But I'm never going to hear about it. <laughs> it. It took um it took the fast way to the ground. <laughs> it beat the rest of the payload by almost an hour. <laughs> in other words, the zip ties that we're holding it on. Bro. Yeah, that was that was our, and it's okay. I got another one. We'll try it again. Uh, is there any other questions from anybody on the phone or in person?